Hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. I'm Kim Granados with the ACES staff, and I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar entitled Understanding Metadata Collection, Management, and Standardization Within Scholarly Research. This is sponsored by DCMI, and we thank them for their participation. Uh, our moderator today is Karen Wickett of the, Uni of the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Uh, she will be taking over in a moment. In the meantime, I'd like to ask the audience to type your questions into the question panel box and they will be answered at the end of the presentation. This session is being recorded and the recording will be available within 24 hours and will be sent to all registrants. I will now turn this session over to Karen, who will introduce our presenter. Hello, thank you for joining us today. This is a webinar sponsored by the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative Education Committee where I am co-chair, uh, and I would like to introduce Matt Mayernick. He's a project scientist and deputy director of the library at NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research. He is also the joint editor-in-chief of the Data Science Journal and is a member of the editorial board of the Journal of the Association for Information Science and Technology, which we all know as JSIST. His research interests include metadata practices and standards, data curation education, data citation and identity, and social and institutional aspects of research data. He received his MLIS and PhD from the UCLA Department of Information Studies. Thank you for joining us today, Matt. Thank you, Karen, and, and thank you all for uh, being on this webinar today. It's exciting for me to be able to present to you, so I appreciate, Karen, the invitation to present and uh, to talk about some of my projects. So I'll get going here. So I'm going to talk about a few different projects, which I'll get into uh, in the next few slides. Um, as a bit of background, the National Center for Atmospheric Research is based in Boulder, Colorado. It's uh, funded by the U.S. federal government, um, but we're not a government agency. We're actually managed by a nonprofit organization, uh, which is called UCAR, the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research. Um, if you ever come to Boulder, Colorado, this is one of our buildings. It's up on the side of the mountain. Uh, you should come check it out. It's a uh, has a little bit of a visitor center and some uh, displays related to atmospheric research. So uh, NCAR, again, the National Center for Atmospheric Research was created, I think in 1960 by the US National Science Foundation to provide expertise and facilities for the university community who's doing atmospheric and related sciences. Uh, and a big part of the role of the center was and is to provide facilities that um, any one university might be hard uh, pressed to provide. That includes computing and as well as uh, research data management services. So my role up within the NCAR library is focused on supporting uh, digital scholarship broadly, as well as um, research data curation uh, and management services, both for our internal scientific staff, as well as um, uh, the university community. Um, our, our organization is about uh, 1,200 people, about 500 to 700 scientists and engineers. Uh, so my role, as uh, Karen suggested, is um, sort of a mixed role, uh, including both uh, research and um, uh, sort of operational support for uh, uh, services, library and data services. So this talk is going to kind of go back and forth between um, both research-oriented projects that I've done in the past, as well as currently, um, as well as uh, some sort of insights drawn from more practical um, operational uh, data management projects. So the overall goal of, and structure of this uh, talk is I'm just going to do a little bit of background as to why I think metadata is interesting and why um, within this context of scientific research, I think there's some really interesting uh, things to look at with regards to metadata. Uh, and then uh, number two, three, and four here are going to be a series of kind of case studies of work that I've done in the past and uh, more recently uh, focused on different aspects of metadata. The kind of structure here is sort of going to start at the bottom. So number two on this list uh, metadata within individual scientific practices is where we're going to start, which is sort of the bottom circle, and kind of then scale out from how an individual might look at or work with metadata to how an organization might deal with it to um, some characteristics you might see at sort of an institutional sector kind of scale. So that's kind of going to be the, the, the sort of um, process here is looking at sort of from a small scale uh, metadata and then sort of scaling out to a couple of different lenses. And um, well, what I'll argue as I go along and come back to at the end is that um, what you see at the individual scale uh, sort of mushrooms and sort of manifests in, in larger ways um, more broadly. So that's going to be the overall focus. 
just to just kind of do a bit of background, I love um, finding things like this. This is back from eight, uh, 1817. Um, this is a, a letter to the Philosophical Magazine, um, which was a, a long-lived publication um, around um, mineralogy. In this case, this is just a quick quote from a, a letter. Uh, it's actually an unsigned letter. I'm not even sure who wrote this letter, uh, but it's about geological specimens and collections. Uh, and the quote here is, for the mineralogist, a simple specimen of each mineral substance is sufficient, but a fossil shell, petrifaction, or mineral is useless to the geologist unless it be accompanied with a proper description of the stratum of the exact place from whence it was obtained. Hence, it is necessary that a descriptive catalog should always accompany a collection of geological specimens. So I love this for a couple of reasons. Obviously, it has a <clears throat> direct connection to the metadata topic, right? Unless, as it says here, unless something is accompanied with a proper description of various details, um, it is essentially useless to a geologist. And I think that's another important point here that metadata usefulness is often um, depending on your point of view. So as this notes, for the mineralogist, a specimen might be sufficient. But for a geologist, so a simple specimen is not sufficient. You need a description of where it came from uh, and when it was obtained. So that's a, a, an important point that I'll come back to is metadata. The value uh, and importance of metadata is often uh, based on a point of view. This is another, um, uh, if you're in, familiar with the metadata world, you may have seen this before from 1997, um, William Michener and colleagues uh, in an overview of, of metadata within ecology. Uh, this is a, always a fun chart to start with. On the left, you have, um, as they describe, information content of data and metadata. Uh, which progressively goes down over time for various reasons. Uh, starting at the top, time of publication, you ha still have a lot of knowledge of data and metadata, but as soon as you publish a paper, you may kind of start forgetting. This has specific details about problems with items, specific dates of collection. As time goes by, general details might be lost. Um, you might have an accidental destruction of data. Uh, people will retire. You have then sort of less knowledge of what was um, uh, um, what data or metadata might have meant. Obviously, we all have finite lives and careers, and at a certain point, um, people pass away and knowledge may be totally lost. So this is, again, one of the roles of metadata is to sort of try to push these curves out to fill in some of these gaps and to prevent some of these losses. And I think within the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative and the ACIST community, we're familiar with these things. This is sort of the premise of a lot of our work. This is a picture that's been around a long time. All right, this is sort of summary of the past two slides. Metadata is a love note to the future. This is just uh, sort of an accompanying, or encompasses that bigger picture idea that you know, metadata is important. This is why we focus on it and why we have professions that are devoted to it. So this, turning back to the science, however, this is often something you see when you look at the science, which is uh, not, not quite in line with those last few slides. This is a file that I found in my um, uh, set of files looking through uh, some of my work in graduate uh, school when I was uh, spending time doing ethnography with scientists of a couple different fields. This is a spreadsheet that I found, and if you're smarter than me, you might be able to figure out what's going on here. Um, but a lot of this is pretty cryptic. There was no metadata associated with this. This is all that there was uh, is this sort of heading at the top. Um, and so you can kind of figure out a little bit of what's going on. Obviously, the timestamp, um, there's sort of a some kind of encoding to the timestamp. Maybe some of you know uh, what, how this is encoded and how to decode this into a, a more real, um, more practical timestamp. Um, there's an ID of something, and then along the top, you start getting these column headings, which obviously is temperature. I think this was probably fluorescence, um, you know, light, wind direction, wind speed. There's no units to any of this, so I have no idea what the units are. You know, why is there five, six different temperatures? I have no idea what these six different temperatures mean. Why is there six of them? Light, what is light? Um, wind direction, there's no indication of, is this a you know, sort of cardinal value? Is this a, a degree of angle? Uh, if so, what's the, what's the zero? Um, wind speed, these are all zero for some reason. Uh, this spreadsheet is actually over 40,000 rows. Every single wind speed I value is zero. So there's some reason why that wind speed is, is there, but it's not being uh, filled out. Uh, it's unlikely that it was just no wind for however long this was run. So this is um, just sort of an example of uh, sort of when you get into talking with scientists and looking at how scientists do their research, you often find things like this, sort of a conundrum of what's going on here. Uh, somebody probably knew what this was uh, at some point, um, but looking from the outside, it's almost impossible to know what any of this means. And that's, of course, what metadata is intended to support.
uh, talking with people, again, you get lots of interesting quotes when you start talking about metadata. Um, here's just a couple um, from a few years ago. So this one says, I haven't been able to figure out from a technician's notes if there's a real change in where the sensor was deployed or if it's, or if it's you know, if the sensor got sent back and was put in water without calibrating the depth sense, sensor or pressure sensor. So there's some data that was collected, but uh, they have no idea if there's a real change in value um, of some value or if that's because there was a calibration error. Here's another one that's uh, always fun. I think metadata is very difficult to create. It's just a pain in the butt. But every once in a while, you thank whoever lucky stars that they put it in there. So I think this is just trying to set up this dichotomy that to me was sort of the foundation of my research in graduate school. We know metadata is important. We know it's essential for many things. But then when you start looking in, in, in depth and you start talking to people, you sort of get this uh, gap. Um, there's, there's not uh, the sort of level of metadata investment you might think given the importance that we often think that there is. So when I started at NCAR, I started attending a lot of informatics conferences and uh, there was a talk by uh, James Frew, who's now Professor Emeritus at the University of California, Santa Barbara, but he's been in the environmental informatics field for a long time. And he, he gave a talk about metadata uh, and sort of tongue in cheek, talked about Frew's two laws. Frew's first law, scientists don't write metadata. Frew's second law, any scientist can be forced to write bad metadata. And this is sort of a, obviously a, it's sort of a joke, but it's also a bit of a truism in reflection to the previous few slides that uh, it's possible to find um, a lot of context where there's very little metadata or what we might consider to be bad metadata. So that's kind of the background. That's to me what was sort of the interesting uh, starting point for me was um, from a library point of view and information science point of view, as I went grad school, graduate school, metadata is important. We need to have great metadata. You start talking with scientists and you sort of find these characteristics that are sort of uh, uh, caricatured by the Frew's two laws. So now I'm going to dig into this individual practices a little bit with some insights from a research project uh, started in graduate school and extended a little bit beyond that. So when I talk about science, um, for the most part, what I was looking at was things like this, people going out in the field, um, studying water, studying the air, studying um, the oceans, earthquakes, uh, things along those lines. More recently um, at NCAR, there's a lot of computer modeling of weather and climate. Uh, of course, there's a lot of science that happens in labs. Um, there's a lot of science that now happens where people set up automated sensors in the field um, with cell phones and, um, of course, ubiquitous technology. So science means a, a, a wide range of things. Um, if you're in the social sciences, I think a lot of these characteristics that I'll be talking about are also pretty similar. So think of science in a broad sense, although I'll, I'll have a few specific examples. First thing I want to emphasize is that when you start talking with scientists about their data, uh, you get quotes like this. The data as a goal is only 5% of the entire research. It's a tool in order to do some research, but the data itself is not really the goal. And I think this is an important thing that we need to keep in mind that for a lot of uh, people who are collecting data and doing science with data, um, you know, the data is not the goal. The great data is sort of a tool towards the goal. Um, and then the second one here, re requests for data. So it's kind of data sharing. Luckily, they're not very frequent because they'd be hard to deal with, right? So it's good luck that people don't ask for their data. Uh, and then the bottom part, we just don't have time or resources to do it. So again, if data is sort of um, just a small portion of what they're doing within the research project and is, is you know, not, not necessarily the top priority, well, metadata, which is necessary to deal with data sharing and requests for data is even a smaller priority. So I think that's just a point of emphasis that uh, metadata is a small um, and often uh, background type of thing that only comes up from time to time. And again, you get lots of quotes like this. I think this may be my last quote. I don't have too many of these, but just I think these are great for illustration. Um, this was about a scientist who was going out in the field. Um, they were studying soil using various sensors that were buried into the ground like this. Uh, and they needed to calibrate them, which um, helped them ensure that the data were uh, of certain quality. So he talked about doing calibrations and documenting that. So at one, at one point, I was keeping track of how we did the calibrations of the sensors. And when we replaced the sensors, for example, we kept track of those things, but I'm not doing it anymore. Well, I'm doing it, so he's still doing the calibrations, but I'm not keeping track anymore. So this was an example of a sort of documentation or metadata practice that changed over time because they uh, found that they weren't looking back at their documentation and so stopped needing to have it. So again, there's sort of this, this kind of uh, 
characterization of metadata as, as being important for the information scientist. Um, but when you look at science at typical practice, it's often kind of invisible and background, and you see a lot of these weird gaps. But that's not to say people aren't doing documentation. And this is quote is one example of where they were doing documentation for at least a certain period of time. And when you start looking at this closely and thinking about documentation in a general sense and metadata as a form of documentation, you know, there is probably typically pretty little metadata generation. Uh, if you think of metadata as sort of structured XML files or, you know, um, uh, standardized files that we often think about in the Dublin core context and in other standardization situations. But there's lots of documentary forms that are being used by uh, people in, in all fields, um, Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, notebooks, annotations, file headers, diagrams, file names are often a very important type of metadata. Uh, if a fraught one, as we, as we know, web pages, uh, computer generated files from equipment and things like that. So you, you often see this sort of patchwork of documentation, right? Rarely is it sort of a big linear file or sort of one encompassing thing that uh, covers all details. It's sort of this patchwork uh, that many people work on together in team context to sort of piece together different types of documentation to ensure that they're able to use data as much as possible. And the concept that was really helpful to me to understand is sort of this patchwork, this gap, uh, these gaps that I was seeing, these sort of funny quotes where people were you know, talking about how they were, um, you know, not very good at doing this or that type of documentation is the notion of accountability. And this became really central to my understanding of, of metadata. Uh, so uh, accountability is um, discussed in social science research in a lot of different ways, but a few kind of characteristics of that that I think are important are uh, just the idea that being accountable is being responsible and answerable uh, to somebody external to you. Um, in strong forms of accountability, there can be sanctions uh, if responsibilities and obligations are not, are not met. Uh, there's also understandings of accountability as sort of meeting situa say, situational expectations of competency. So if you're accountable for something um, by somebody else, then that somebody else expects you to be competent uh, in certain situations. And then and there's also just the sort of more literal sense of accountability of being able to give accounts of both routine and anomalous events. And uh, if I sort of step back away from you know uh, scientific research, uh, one uh, maybe other example of this type of issue is uh, and this has happened to me multiple times in the past few years where I've been in an airport and my plane got delayed for whatever reason. It's not, usually not clear. Um, and the longer the delay is, the more likely you're able to get an explanation from somebody. Uh, and there's been a couple times when I've been told that the plane was delayed, not because there was any issue with the plane, but because they needed to get a signature on something. Like they needed to be able to have the, either the mechanic sign something or some sort of ins inspector sign a document before they can take the plane off. To me, this is a, a sort of, if you think of signature as a type of metadata, um, this is really an, an accountability issue, right? The airline is accountable for a safe flight. And even if the plane is safe, until they have metadata that indicates that they're accountable for checking it, for meeting uh, the situational expectation of ensuring a safe plane, uh, they can't take that plane off. And there's big sanctions if you fly things without having the right accounts and accountability um, sort of check boxes made. So think about um, that type of uh, example here. Um, you know, you, you can have great data, but if you don't have metadata that sort of makes it accountable as um, 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 useful evidence, then you can't use those data. And so on that fourth point, which is sort of being able to give accounts, um, this is, I think, another thing that was very interesting to me uh, when talking to people is you often find they, they kind of sound like excuses, but I don't think they are, and I don't want to characterize them as that. It's more sort of reasons why people can explain potential problems in metadata. And these are sort of generic versions. So these are not exact quotes. These are my sort of summarizing types of accounts that you'll hear from people when talking about metadata and potential gaps that they may have. These are related, but I think they're sort of subtly different. So a couple of these, I'll just talk through them. So for example, you might talk with people and they may sort of describe their metadata in this way, that our metadata are not complete but we know that what we need to document and we can do so if necessary. So this is kind of that example I gave earlier of the calibrations where they were doing it for a while and then not doing it. So they knew that they were sort of documenting things anymore, but if they needed to, they could do it. Similarly with the second one, my metadata processes may not be sufficient individually, but as our team, our practices are sufficient. This, is, this was a common one. 
So somebody acknowledging, well, my documentation isn't great, but my colleague is really you know, better at that. So I rely on them to do that. Um, and then I'm going to skip for the sake of time down to the bottom one, which is that um, it, you know, we have established metadata practices. They would be effective if everyone followed them all the time. Right? So again, this kind of sounds like an excuse, but I think it's really just a way to for people to acknowledge that there are important things, aspects of documentation and metadata. They do them when they need to, and sometimes they don't. And in those cases, um, they lose track of things. So there's kind of this spectrum from practical accountabilities to sort of day-to-day -day stuff, working with your collaborators, being able to answer their questions, you know, having sort of this, you know, little word documents or, or headers or something that explain things. And then these bigger accountabilities that happen more at a societal or institutional level around funder mandates, journal requirements, and organizational policies. And that's, I think, um, where we've been trying to sort of bridge that gap um, within our data curation community and the information science community broadly over the past 10 to 20 years. So just to summarize this particular section, um, metadata, when you're looking at individual people, um, right, they, they, they encompass negotiated shared meanings. And what I mean by that is that when people generate these documentary forms, whether they're Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, whatever they are, those things are created with the expectation that somebody knows how to use them and interpret them. So even if there are gaps, whoever, whoever has created this expects that somebody is not going to be um, affected by those gaps where the people who they've created them for will not be uh, impacted by those gaps. Or else they can, they can uh, fill those gaps by simply talking to people, right? So um, having sort of a more verbal uh, communication form that um, glosses over any metadata gaps. And then accountabilities matter, as I mentioned. So metadata exists as resources for communication. Right? So this is kind of the, the Word document that helps people account for data but also for evaluation or something to be accountable for. So there are people um, sometimes who are accountable for creating metadata, and if they don't do it, they can lose their job. I have multiple examples of that. This last line, I just kind of toss this in here. Uh, maybe there can be more discussion of this. I don't have any great theoretical thoughts here, but this is just something I am feeling more and more that is an important thing, that some people just care. <laughs> some people just care about data, just care about metadata. Maybe it's because it's their job, but sometimes you just have people who are in the same job categories they're doing the same type of work, and this person just seems to care, and that person doesn't. I think it's hard to explain that in any theoretical way, but uh, I think there's more of that than we might uh, discuss. Okay, so that was within individual practices. Now I'm going to sort of step out and abstract a little bit to an organizational process. Check my time. So at NCAR, and again, the National Center for Atmospheric Research, this is where I work now and have since 2011. As I mentioned, we're a facility um, that's funded to support uh, atmospheric research and related research in the atmospheric sciences uh, and across the university community. So we have a number of data systems and repositories, uh, which are sort of depicted here at the top. Uh, some for more large complex data around climate models and other sort of large scale data sets. Uh, some for observational facilities on the right. We have a solar uh, telescope facility. Um, uh, we also have a field uh, data archive, which uh, has lots of data related to flying planes in um, uh, tornadoes, in um, hurricanes, doing radar of hailstorms, things like that. So we have a broad number of, of data systems. They're kind of all independent, and that's a bit of a, um, an issue sometimes, but uh, they sort of grew up independently over time. They have independent staffs. Often their technologies are pretty separate. Um, and uh, they serve often different communities. So, you know, the solar community uh, who studies upper air and upper, upper atmosphere is impacted by the sun to the climate community. So often the data systems need to be quite different for those different communities. So this is kind of the current state and we continually work on, on making these things more um, coherent, but that's sort of an ongoing line of work. What I'm talking about today is an effort that we started a few years ago to do a search system that lays over top of all these uh, repository systems, which we call the dash search. Dash standing for the Digital Asset Services Hub. And that URL there, data.ucar.edu, is live, and this is actually a live system, has been for a few years now. So I'm going to talk about how we kind of came to build this and metadata issues related to that. Prior to developing this system, uh, which was went live in 2017, uh, all of these sites had their own search systems. If you wanted to get data from NCAR, you had to go to you know four or five different systems independently uh, to discover data, um, and that was um, a known problem, and so we built this search system to address that. Some key metadata questions to uh, look at this. Again, we're sort of looking now at the organizational layer as opposed to an individual person layer. Uh, 
Uh, what kind of a metadata framework do you need for a cross-organizational search system? How to generate standardized metadata, data, metadata across diverse organizational units? So as I noted here, there's at least five different groups. And in fact, um, as we dug into this, there were quite a few more than five. Uh, there were some data sets that were held outside of these managed repositories um, and uh, lots of diversity in data across our organization. So that was number two, how to generate standardized metadata. And then the third one is, um, you know, this is not a one-time thing, right? How do you ensure metadata compliance and quality at an organizational level over time? So what we're tr trying to do is in some sense, sort of build on top of those individual practices I just mentioned. Um, now we do have, as I said, these managed repositories that do have data curation staff uh, in, in, in most or all cases. So that's kind of one layer I'm, I'm sort of jumping over here, but uh, obviously the data curation staff has been very important in creating standardized metadata within each of these sort of boxes. Uh, and so what we're trying to do here is create a metadata, um, metadata framework that cuts across all of these different systems that have their own different uses and needs. So I'm gonna go through these independently now. So the first effort to develop a search system was to kind of identify what kind of metadata we needed uh, and what kind of framework we needed to uh, encompass all of the data sets within our organization. So this was an effort that started around 2015. The criteria we used for looking at metadata uh, in this context and kind of trying to create a common framework was we wanted a balance between comprehensiveness that supported lots of different types of data, but also ease of use that um, both data curation staff and non-data curation staff, so scientists, so who are more in the bucket of my previous discussion in the first uh, section of this talk, people who aren't experts uh, would be able to understand. We wanted to be consistent with comparable organizations, so we weren't kind of creating our own, you know, um, idiosyncratic metadata approach. For us, comparable organizations were um, US federal uh, uh, systems like NASA data centers, um, other um, uh, federally funded uh, data systems within the atmospheric sciences. Internationally as well, we were looking at um, European uh, weather, you know, weather data centers and things like that. We also wanted a metadata framework or a standard that had an established tool base. So we didn't want to have to develop a lot of new tools to enable technical implementations of a search system. So uh, we looked at a, a number of different schemas, but we'll, what we sort of dialed in on were these three here, uh, the data site metadata schema, and then two uh, variants of this ISO 19115 metadata schema, uh, which is a geospatial metadata standard that kind of comes out of the NASA and uh, other sort of similar organization sector. It's much more complicated. We didn't look explicitly at the Dublin Core. Um, it's simply because the data site metadata schema is, is fairly similar to Dublin Core uh, in terms of its level of um, uh, detail and sort of size. Like I think there's 15 or 18 elements now, maybe. Um, and it also is, was specifically created to um, have metadata for DOIs, for data sets. So it was designed to support data set metadata. And we were already using that in a number of contexts when we were creating DOIs for data sets. Where we ended up uh, deciding to move forward with was the ISO 19115 2003 version. Now, so again, this was around 2015. At the time, the um, updated ISO, which was released in 2014, uh, was still quite new. Um, we weren't aware of many or any organizations that were using it. There was not really a tool base, whereas there was a good tool base around uh, this older version. Um, and so we kind of decided to move forward with that because it had a, a lot of detail that it could be allowed, uh, could support. Um, uh, but it also enabled us to be consistent with data site by having certain recommendations for vocabularies and um, you know, resource type designations and things that the data site um, schema used and we also used to assign DOIs. So that's where we started. Then we developed uh, what we called a metadata dialect. That's dialect is a, a sort of term that we got from Ted Haberman, who's a longtime colleague uh, in the in the uh, Earth Science Informatics and Metadata field. And the idea there is that uh, any implementation of a standard um, needs sort of interpretive interpretation, right? It, it, the idea of a metadata dialect is sort of like you know when we all speak English. But there's different dialects from the UK to the US to Australia, even within the US from, you know, the, the sort of northeast to the southwest of the country, you have different uh, sort of flavors of how you speak that language. And so this is the same idea, even though we're using this ISO 19115-2003 metadata schema, we have our own sort of implementation and, and variant of it. And so we call that a dialect. 
And also um, the way we implemented that was to develop specific recommendations about which fields we wanted to use as required for our purposes. Some of them are required by the schema itself, but uh, in, in some cases we had other ones that were required. And then we developed a, just a recommendation internally for what we called enhanced metadata, which are things that would support, again, within the data search system, more uh, specific features such as um, spatial maps or spatial resolutions, file formats, uh, how big how big files were, um, temporal fields that might not have been required. We also then developed recommendations on certain fields for an ISO to data site mapping. To do this, uh, the way we did all of this is we had a committee of folks from across those data um, centers that I had in my first slide in this section, those five or six boxes. Uh, and we had people just kind of talk through these things. It took a long time <laughs> to develop the schema. It was just meeting after meeting. Um, you know, we had examples. We worked through um, uh, various cases. We tried to display them. It was just a long iterative process of coordination and sort of engagement with the community to come to a recommendation for our internal metadata. That was just for the framework. Then we needed to work on, well, how do we actually generate these records? Um, many of the existing managed data archives that I showed on that first figure with those five boxes, um, they have good technology and they already are able to export to this standard. They just had to tweak it to uh, kind of be compliant with our dialect. Uh, that's kind of the first two bullets. Um, we uh, implemented an XML editor for semi-automated creation of, of XML records because uh, this uh, schema is um, um, serialized as XML records. That was great for people who really understood metadata, but for a lot of the scientists who were more in sort of the bucket that I described earlier, who really don't think about data that much or metadata, uh, this was really challenging. Uh, and it was almost impossible to use this XML editor that enabled the full um, detail of the schema. So we simplified things a lot to have a single entry Google form uh, that people just filled out, you know, 10 or 15 fields, and then it, it generated a Google spreadsheet. And then we had a curator on the back end to actually take that and sort of turn that into an XML record that was compliant with the schema. So it took us longer than probably should have for us to figure that out. Um, but that was an important turn that really helped us get some metadata records from the scientists who, as I said before, um, uh, were really challenged to deal with these complicated metadata schemas and didn't think about these things in the same way. Uh, eventually, we also created a translate translation from data site metadata to ISO XML. So if somebody has assigned a DOI, um, using metadata. They don't need to regenerate that. We just sort of transform that to ISO XML. Um, as, as an organization, the way this came together is we use GitHub folders. So it was nothing super complicated. We just set up a folder structure for each group and said, dump your XML records in there. And then the indexing system will just harvest that uh, every so often each day. And as I said, this went public in 2017. Uh, this is an ongoing effort. Uh, so we're still working on this. Um, File formats has been something we're digging into very recently. Uh, we've had over 100 different file format labels. Uh, and as you can see here, there's a lot of variants of even the same types of things. Uh, ASCII, and you see a lot of ASCII. And uh, variants of ASCII, these numbers are numbers of records that have this particular label. Uh, NetCDF and HDF are important ones in our field, uh, file formats. We had a lot of variants on that. So this is an ongoing iterative process that we're still working through to update metadata, uh, to continue to engage the community, and to continue to make improvements. So just to summarize this really quickly, so I'm getting short on time. Um, at an organizational level, there's really this sort of, you're building on these diverse practices that I described in the first section. There's coordination, there's patience. This all took three years probably to get from uh, the beginning to the sort of framework. Could have been shorter if we had short-circuited some of the coordination, um, but that was really important. And then metadata processes and products must be periodically revisited. So the idea of re-curation, I think, is an important one that we can uh, use to make sure metadata stays useful over time. OK, so then I'm going to abstract one more time and, and sort of, you know, we talked about the individual person and how that then sort of bubbles up to an organizational layer. And now how does this look at an institutional level, which is sort of a, se a sector of, of many similar facilities? So this was a research project that we recently published uh, with uh, my colleague Eugenia Liopich. Is a citation at the bottom. And actually, our initial question for this, which was not really a research question, but just sort of a curiosity, is, is anybody using that newer version of the ISO schema that I mentioned before? We had looked at that in 2015, and it was not really much use. And we wanted to see, is anybody using this? And anybody, by anybody, I mean other data centers. 
And so we developed some specific research questions that are you know, a bit more uh, publishable uh, to, to dig into this, which are listed here. So how do metadata standards, vocabularies, and data access modes differ between data facilities within a specific community? And then what are the implications of those differences? So we wanted to, ca to canvas a number of sort of similar data facilities to see how metadata standardization looked at a sector level. This was based on, inspired by the FAIR principles. Uh, for the sake of time, I won't go through this in detail, uh, but there are some specific principles um, in this which are, have been important principles to guide data curation work for the past 10 years. Uh, a few specific sub-principles related to metadata around um, both uh, standards and vocabularies. So what we did is we looked at a, a number of different data facilities who are, part, who are members of a few different organizations, the Council of Data Facilities, Near Science Information Partners. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm just gonna say that these are uh, both membership organizations where data centers opt in to becoming members of these, and the numbers are shown here at the bottom. Um, so we started with 149 facilities from those two groups, a couple of, a handful are, which are members of both, and then we excluded quite a few because we simply couldn't either find a website or they actually didn't provide data. They were um, uh, more partners in some way. And we ended up examining 55 facilities in detail when we, our question was from the public websites of these facilities, what metadata standards do they use and represent and what subject and keyword vocabularies did they use? So we really wanted to know metadata standard and subject terms and how, uh, how standardized were those within this sector. Just to give an indication of size of these facilities, um, most of them were within, within 1,000 to 10,000 data sets. Some were quite small, some were much, much larger, uh, a couple we couldn't quite figure out. So in general, these were sort of between 100 to 100,000 data sets, um, so some quite large, these data facilities. And this is what we found, uh, just kind of cutting right to the, the findings. So again, we were looking at they're public facing websites only. We were not looking at APIs or anything like that because that was really hard to get a grasp on. And so what we found is that this ISA 19115 schema, which is what we use, as I mentioned, for our data search system, is the most commonly used. Um, the next highest bucket, was, which was 20, was is unknown, meaning we just couldn't figure out if they were using a standard or not. They had some metadata, but it was unclear if it was standardized or if it was what standard they were using. There were a number of these. Uh, the next three are actually all NASA facilities. So uh, NASA, that's Adam, uh, NASA facilities used as well. And this directory interchange format is also a NASA facility. So those are all the same eight uh, using those. And then you can see this sort of smattering of others down as it goes along. These are all various metadata standards uh, and used in different sectors. Um, there was only one that we saw that we're using this, this newer version of ISO, which was kind of where we started this question. Uh, which was very interesting because this study was done in 2022, I believe, 2021 or 2022. So even seven years after the standard was released, it's still much more common for people to use the older version, almost 20 years old, than the newer version. Within the keyword sector, just looking at subject terms and keywords, we saw in some sense more centralization, but also a lot more diversity. There was only one standard that was used by really more than one organization, which was this uh, Global Change Master Directory. This is the, a NASA facility, or sorry, a NASA keyword directory. And this is what we use at NCAR as well. Um, beyond that, we saw a lot of use of custom keywords. Again, there was just some, there were some keywords or subject terms, but there was no indication of where they came from. A handful of, of facilities use no subject terms. And then this huge list of uh, use of uh, different types of subject terms that were used by only one organization or MOS2 including Library of Cong Congress subject headings, uh, all sorts of uh, sci specific scientific keyword vo um, vocabularies. I'm gonna skip that one for the sake of time. So uh, the key points in this last section is that um, it was very interesting looking at data facilities that were not my own, <laughs> trying to find data and metadata. Uh, the, the variation among public interfaces um, in different data centers is really amazing. And that can be, it can actually be quite hard to even find data, uh, even when you know it's a data facility. Generally, what we saw is there's consistency within a single system, but there, there is some inter-organizational variation of different systems by the same organization. Older metadata standards are still prominent. Is there an early adopter penalty for these newer metadata standards? I think that's something that we could discuss. Um, uh, you know, why is why is no one sort of taking leadership opportunities? Maybe we can even ask ask that question within a Mayoran organization to adopt newer metadata standards. 
And then within the keyword space, there was that one keyword vocabulary that was fairly widely used, otherwise almost no overlap. And so just to kind of summarize what I want to kind of pull out of this particular section, I know I'm going fast here, is that when you look at, at, at the sort of institutional sector level, you can see internal consistency within individual facilities, but at a community level, the consistency is really hard to find. Maybe this is specific to the earth sciences, but I'd be very interested in your perspective uh, for those of you who work in other sectors, uh, social sciences or biology or other types of fields. How much consistency is there among our data facilities? Even if we're standardized internally, at a community level, it seems like standardization uh, is still, um, there's a big gap. Significant variation in metadata standards, keyword vocabularies, and metadata displays. So this is going to be my last slide. I'm just coming back here uh, to this big picture overview. And I'm very much looking forward to your comments. So where we started out with sort of this idiosyncrasy of individual practices. Uh, when you sort of scale up, you kind of see how that bubbles into diversity at an organizational level. And then uh, ultimately to kind of this bigger picture non-standardization. Now, obviously, there's lots of things that gets glossed over in the transition between these uh, these different sort of lenses. Um, but I think there's there's this is sort of the natural trend of things, right? If, if there's nothing pulling pulling away from these trends, this is where things would go. You have idiosyncratic at the individual level, which leads to diversity at an organization level and non-standardization at the individual or sorry, the institutional sector level. And this is, of course, where a lot of work is happening and to try to pull these things back together to have um, community norms, to have institutional policies from federal funders, to build common infrastructures that maybe uh, uh, ameliorate some of these issues. Professional support, which again is a detail I, I kind of glossed over, but data curation as a profession, uh, which is certainly an area that I'm invested in. Um, that tends to happen at the organizational level. Uh, that's an important way of sort of pulling back on some of these trends on the right. And sort of the, they're sort of natural tendencies um, uh, which are the kind of characteristics on the right. And then these accountabilities that I talked about, how do we in increase or increase the visibility of certain accountabilities uh, to um, kind of pull away from these trends towards idiosyncrasy and non-standardization? Sometimes there's good reasons to have your own practices and to have non-standardized approaches, um, but there may be a lot of cases where there's uh, practical benefits from data use uh, and data value uh, to have less of that. So there's kind of, there's sort of opposite trends uh, and sort of opposite forces and we're, we um, as a profession and as a community I think are working on uh, you know addressing these issues in various ways. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, I appreciate again all of your attention and I'm very happy to take questions. Um, please feel free to get in touch with me if you're interested in any of this and I thank um, my many many colleagues who've been involved in all these projects. Great, thanks, Matt. Uh, so, yeah, people, if you have questions or you know observations you'd like to share, uh, you can go. Ahead. We're using the uh, the question tab, uh, so you, where there's a little uh, uh, speech bubble with a question mark in it. So if you put them there, uh, we'll be checking those. Uh, so um, we do have a question here from Ink Young Choi. She asks. Um, <clears throat> She says, thanks for the great talk. Agreed. Uh, I'm curious about the use of subject vocabularies. How common for research data management is it to have subject fields in metadata? And what are the real use cases for them? Are they commonly used for information retrieval, analysis of research data, or are they not that central of a part of uh, metadata in research data management? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think what we saw, um, which is uh, was one of the slides, I, again, was going quickly and apologize for that towards the end here, but um, what we saw was that most facilities that we looked at in this particular study, um, so basically everything except for this none category, had subjects, terms, or keywords of some kind. So that would be 44 or 55, so you know about 80%. So it's pretty common to have them. Um, it, they definitely vary in um, you know, number, and in detail, you know, there are a couple, there were, I couldn't give exact numbers on this because it's, I don't remember, but there were definitely facilities who had, you know, two keywords and they were just two terms, you know, uh, you know, marine and ecosystem or something in a pretty high level. These NASA global change master directory of keywords are a hierarchical set of keywords that are a little bit more detailed. Uh, so some facilities listed all of the hierarchy from, you know, sort of level one to level six. Some just had one term. 
so it varied quite a bit. In terms of the use, I think the use is um, more for discovery and sort of cutting across data uh, sets. You know, if you find one that's, uh, um, you know, uh, wind speed is what you're interested in, you could click on that and that could take you to the wind speed uh, tagged data, uh, data sets. So I think that was mostly the use. I don't know that they really facilitated analysis in any way. It was more, you know, if you're interested in this data set, um, here's some keywords that might point you to other related ones. Um, they also commonly show up in the search system, which is one of the reasons we use them in our search system as a facet. So, you know, you do a search of some generic term climate, you get a thousand data sets and you've got some faceted uh, search subject terms on the left to filter by. So that's another common use of those. Uh, I, I would say that for the sci the individual scientists, going back to my starting point, um, they probably don't matter a whole lot. <laughs> it's more, I think, something that the, the facilities are interested in to enable search. Great. Thank you. Um, so if other folks have questions, go ahead and uh, type them in. Uh, so I had a couple questions, which, uh, so one was just, um, and you talked about this a little bit, but I wondered if you could reflect a little more on kind of the we well, didn't use this term, but sort of the infrastructural elements that scientists are working with and that the, the, um, the, the data centers are working with and what you think they contribute to metadata and where you think they are kind of stumbling blocks or uh, as we like the term friction, right? Where they, where they are sort of creating friction or where they're uh, reducing friction. Yeah, I think a big, um thing that I would note here, and I touched on this a little bit, but is that the metadata system schemas that we use, even something like the data site, which isn't too complicated, it's a little bit more complicated than Dublin Core, but not that much so, they're still quite complicated for somebody who's coming into this without a whole lot of knowledge. You know, what's an attribute? What's an element? Why is this thing here? You know, what are the quotes? You know, um, some of the basic syntax things, but also, you know, what are they even looking at? And so uh, I, I touched on this idea of having a, you know, we, we eventually created a Google form to try to solve some of this issue. And to me, that was sort of the infrastructural issue was how do you take a complex schema or even a somewhat complex schema and sort of abstract it away through tools and technology um, so that the people who need to create the metadata don't have to deal with that technology or sort of deal with the complexity. And there's kind of this tension between having a, you know, infrastructure tools that allow you to deal with the full complexity of a schema, which might actually be beneficial if, if you really can take advantage of that, um, versus having a simpler tool that sort of prevents you from being able to use all of the complexities of the schema. You know, because if you have 35 elements and they each have three attributes, you know, that's 100 elements in your Google form and you just can't put that in front of a scientist. So, you know, how can you take something that's 10 to 20 uh, concepts and then sort of turn that into a complex schema. I, I think that was a, a big challenge for us. The other part is, um, again, taking these complex schemas and then turning them into something that's understandable to a data user. So how do you, how do you again, pull it apart, display it in use, uh, useful and inter interesting ways? Uh, so we did a lot of um, usability testing, which I didn't discuss, but when we were developing this data system to try to take this metadata schema and turn it into something that meant something useful to um, you know, a scientist who we wanted to serve with this data. So those are a couple of things that I think are certainly tension points that, you know, the, the schemas and the infrastructures that are built on these schemas are complex for a reason, but they can't be that complex if they're put in front of a scientist. Thanks. Um, so another question I had was about uh, sort of the, the lack of uptake you saw for the updated ISO standard. Um, and you said a little bit about this, but I wondered if you could reflect a little bit more on why you think that might be, uh, whether this is kind of, I, I mean, I have my own thoughts too, but I would like to hear here is just kind of yeah. well, what you think might be going on there. Yeah, we discussed this a little bit in the paper, and so you, you might look at that too, but the, I think points we made, made there are that um, when you're moving from a schema to a schema, you're not just doing that. You're in fact dealing with all the things that were involved in your last question, right? You're you're essentially going from one ecosystem to another or one infrastructure to another or one set of infrastructures to another set of infrastructures. And so you can't just change the schema. You have to change all the tooling that goes around it. 
You have to change all your forms, right? If you have input forms, including all the levels of complexity that I just discussed. If you have transforms, you have to change all your transforms. You have to do outreach, right? So you have to tie into your kind of community in involvement, engagement. You have to, if you're changing things, you have to tell everyone <laughs> who's dealing with the old thing that you're changing. So um, I think that's a, a, a big part of it is that you're, you're, you're changing not just one thing, you're changing almost everything that you're doing uh, that, that touches the schema. And so if the metadata is the core of the sort of tool, which it is in this case, because it's a search over these metadata records, you're having to change everything. So there's a big lift. I think the other part of it is the, you know, just this well-known sort of thing around standards that, you know, standards are, ben the more, standards are more beneficial the more people use them. And if you're in sort of this group who's using this standard, and then you are the one group that goes outside and starts working with this other standard, then now you're no longer standardized, at least at, at this sector level, right? So you become the outlier. And so maybe there's a leadership opportunity, which I had in one of my slides, that you know to sort of help the community move forward. But until that happens, you're the one who's outside, who's outside the norm. Uh, and so um, other issues of kind of um, federated search and cross-organizational search and um, you know, Google search and things like this that take advantage of these standards, you're now the outlier. So I think it's a combination of both those factors, the level of effort, and then you're sort of deliberately, you know, if no one else is doing it, deliberately taking yourself outside of this sort of institutional um, uh, standard, uh, institutional consistency, um, which then puts you kind of at, at odds with everyone else if they don't come along right. with you. Right. It's sort of, it's what's striking. One thing that's striking about it though, is that it's, in a sense, it seems like it's the same stand. I don't know how much difference there is between these, right? But when you say it's the updated version of the standard, it, there's there seems like there should be a lot of continuity there. Uh, and there yeah, and there, and there is, and there's actually important potential benefits to the new standard, such as in the last standard, again, because it was 2003, this is before yeah. persistent identifiers were a thing. Yeah. So there's really no support in the old ISO for DOIs for data sets, for ORCIDs for people, for any other kinds of these persistent identifiers. And so the new standard does have a better support for that. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one of the real practical benefits and, and motivations is that as we use persistent identifiers, this new standard would have better support for that. Um, there's a few other small tweaks, but a, a lot of it is, again, the tooling um, yeah. uh, around generating these records. And, and that all needs to be updated. Even if there's small tweaks, you need to update yeah. it. And anything needs yeah. to be updated as a task. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, okay, so I have another question that's a little bit more outside the box, I guess I would say, from from the rest of your discussion, which is when you're looking, when you're kind of showing um, the sorts of data sets you work with, and you talk about uh, the global climate data, and I wondered if you had seen any impact of sort of the controversy and political activity around climate change on how, on what, on, on metadata and what kind of has been the practices of metadata uh, for that uh, sort of domain. Yeah, yeah, so I have been looking at the global climate model um, data because I think it's super interesting as well. Um, I, I'm gonna talk about a high level because I don't wanna mischaracterize it for the reasons you just described. But I do think that, you know, the some of the climate controversies around you know emails that were stolen and things like that around 2010 did have an impact. Um, there's a, a big project which is called the CMIP, Coupled Model Intercomparison Project, which is an international effort to basically compile climate models from all over the world, uh, data from climate models from all over the world, to um, look at how they compare and what they, you know, what consistencies they have in terms of projecting future trends uh, and what differences they have. Uh, which then helps them uh, you know, diagnose errors in their models. Um, so that's been an iterative project that's gone since the 90s. And I can say that around 2000, the 2009 to 10 period when this was happening, there was a significant kind of re-engineering of their metadata approach to get a lot more metadata of um, the models themselves, the climate models, and how and the connections between the model and the data, uh, so the model and their output. Um, and actually this introduced, you, you kind of commented earlier about frictions. This introduced a lot of frictions um, to the climate modeling centers because all of a sudden they had these very significant climate model metadata requirements that they needed to fill out. Um, and people talked about how it would, you know, it would take two weeks or, you know, six weeks to fill out these um, metadata structures to describe their model, which they didn't have to do before. 
They also around that time started assigning DUIs to data so they could track their data sets better, um, which itself was a complicated process because a lot of these model climate model runs were sort of, there were different versions of them, uh, which uh, I'm gonna kind of gloss over that, but there was a lot of questions about what should it, what should be assigned to DOI? Who do you assign, you know, who do you give credit for a DOI if, this, if these are, you know, hundreds and thousands of people who worked on these models? So that's all kind of been iterating over the past 10 years and trying to have better provenance of these model outputs and what models they came from, um, both to kind of provide the transparency related to that issue that you described, but also to enable better comparison of these models so that you can more easily say, okay, this model and this model are very comparable. Now we can pull them their data together. So it's, it's definitely been a, um, some, some evolution because of that issue. Okay. Yeah, really interesting. Okay. Uh, well, I think um, that's all my questions. Uh, and um, so I think we can wrap it up here. Thank you so much, Matt, uh, for all your uh, insights and interesting questions and work that you shared today. Yeah. Thank you, Karen, and thank you for everyone for attending. All right. Thank you, Matt, for presenting this informative webinar here. Uh, and also, Karen, thank you for moderating this session and to the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative for sponsoring this session. I want to remind the listeners that one of the many ACES member benefits is complimentary access to all of our webinars. And a recording of today's webinar and a copy of the slides will be posted to the ACES website by tomorrow and will be available to all ACES members and paid registrants. Uh, within 24 hours, attendees will receive an email with a recording of the webinar and a survey. I encourage you to complete that within seven days. Again, I'm Kim Granados with ACES staff, and I thank you for attending today's webinar. This concludes our session. <laughs>